hope I won't be uh, as long as the previous speakers. I'll try to keep it short in light of we have another uh, speaker uh, next. But it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Um, public and cultural diplomacy is just one aspect of a country's effort to develop a positive image in the world community. Soft power takes many forms, much of which does not involve governments. Just look at the role of Hollywood in promoting various images of the United States for many years. And now we have the Korean wave. Uh, at this symposium, we've heard from many speakers, and there'll be more coming tomorrow, focusing on this issue from a US perspective. But my purpose today is to talk about this from a Korean perspective. It's kind of odd that I'm an American. <laughs> so, um, so first, I'll talk about the views of the United States in Korea. And then I'll talk about the public perception of Korea in the United States and the role that the institute that I work for, the Korean Economic Institute of America, plays as part of the effort to enhance the views uh, Americans have of Korea. So first, it's important to recognize the immense rise of Korea from the ashes of war. Few thought in 1953 that Korea would eventually rise to become one of the world's largest and developed economies. Korea was once America's top foreign aid recipient. Now Korea offers overseas development assistance. Up until the 1970s, the per capita GDP in South Korea was less than North Korea. Now I'm sure many of you are familiar with the incredible satellite image of the Korean Peninsula at night, showing all the lights and intense energy in South Korea in contrast to the northern portion of the peninsula, which is almost in complete darkness. So in South Korea, the per capita GDP measured in terms of purchasing power parity is $33,200 a year. So it outpaces countries such as New Zealand, Spain, and Italy. In fact, Moody's Investors Services recently estimated that within four years, South Korea's per capita GDP will surpass the projected level in Japan and France. But at the same time, the per capita GDP in North Korea is only $1,800 a year, the second lowest in all of Asia. As a result, there is a reservoir of goodwill towards America and South Korea most prevalent among the older generation who endured the Korean War. However, this older generation currently comprises about 12% of the Korean population. But most Koreans now understand that the United States is on the front lines with them to defend their hard-earned freedoms and economic gains. According to the most recent BBC World Service poll, 58% of South Koreans have a mainly positive view of the United States, the highest in all of Asia. Gallup had a similar result of 58% of South Koreans approve of US leadership. This has been the product of both hard and soft power over the years. Not only does the United States have 28,500 troops to help deter North Korean aggression, but the US instituted many soft power initiatives that have helped develop South Korea over the years. So measured in current US dollars, America provided over $77 billion in economic and military aid to Korea since the end of World War II. This is not counting the cost of the Korean War, which is estimated to be over $340 billion. Nevertheless, nearly half was economic assistance, and over a third of the aid was delivered during the critical years after the end of the Korean War. For example, there were nearly 2,000 Peace Corps volunteers who served in Korea from 1966 to 1981. And one of the most famous alumni of the Peace Corps program in Korea is Kathleen Stevens, who eventually returned to Korea in 2008 as our US ambassador. However, all was not well in the US-Korea relationship for many years. Many Koreans blame the United States for what they perceived as propping up the authoritarian regime in Seoul and for the division in the <coughs> Korean Peninsula. 
Back in the mid-1980s, 63% of the people of Korea were under the age of 30 and thus had no memory of the role of America had in protecting their families during the Korean War. Thus, these young Koreans of the so-called 386 generation were shaped by different events, most notably the student uprising in 1980. And even when America pressured the South Korean government to move away from authoritarianism and towards democracy, some Korean activists resented this outside influence, even if they agreed with the cause. Then with America's war on terror extending to Iraq, and then the 2002 incident where a US military vehicle fatally injured two 14-year-old South Korean girls, and then we have Apollo Ono winning the speed skating gold medal, and he did it through a disqualification of the South Korean skater. The image of the United States and Korea dropped precipitously despite all of our good efforts over the past uh, few decades. So in 2006, the same BBC World Service poll that I mentioned earlier had a majority of South Koreans, 53%, with a negative view of America's influence in the world. In 2007, only 28% of South Koreans approved of U.S. leadership, according to Gallup. The now famous South Korean pop star Psy wrapped in an anti-American song after he smashed a model of a Bradley fighting vehicle on stage. But Psy has since apologized for his participation in that concert. But even in despite of this record low approval rate of Americans in South Korea during that time, South Korea still contributed over 3,000 troops to help fight the war in Iraq. But America's image has improved since as mentioned before with the polls showing the view of uh, Americans in South Korea going up. But what changed? First, I think it was the election of President Barack Obama. It created a clean break from the perceived over-militarization of American foreign policy during the Bush administration. Even though as it relates to the Korean Peninsula, President Bush expended much political capital in the unsuccessful effort to negotiate North Korea's nuclear uh, denuclearization. However, North Korea began a series of provocative behaviors, starting with a second nuclear test in 2009. North Korea sunk a South Korean naval vessel, killing 46 sailors. And then North Korea shelled a neighboring island, which killed two civilians. This, these events took place in 2010. Then there were further missile and nuclear tests by North Korea in 2012 and 2013. These events reminded South Koreans about the importance of the U.S.-Korea alliance and that the U.S. troops stationed in Korea and places in the region are there to protect them. As a result, most Koreans now have a positive view of America. But what about the American perception of Korea? For many years, Americans viewed Korea through the prism of the Forgotten War. U.S. military personnel who fought in Korea never received a homecoming parade, unlike their World War II predecessors. Some believe that the U.S. lost nearly 37,000 military personnel for next to nothing, just for a draw. There wasn't a complete victory like the U.S. experienced against the Axis powers in World War II. The brutal North Korean mafia-style regime is still in place, and the U.S. still has troops stationed in South Korea to serve as a deterrent to future North Korean aggression. And in terms of cultural diplomacy, one of the highest rated shows in U.S. television, television history was MASH. I don't know if some of you remember that show. Maybe you might be too young. But anyway, this dark comedy show aired during the 1970s and early 80s. During the same time, the American public was wrestling with the Vietnam War and its aftermath. Under what is unfortunately now considered routine for American entertainment, the show often questioned and even mocked America's role in Korea and by implication Vietnam, and also authority figures in general. For example, the theme song of MASH, how many of you know what it is? The words were never said in the song, it was just the tune, 
but if you ever looked it up, the theme, the title of the song is Suicide is Painless. So this gives us an insight as to what the image makers in Hollywood thought about the alternatives for those fighting to protect the Korean people from the communist north. <coughs> Layered on top of this was the authoritarian re regime governing Korea at the time. Many Americans did not understand why U.S. soldiers were still stationed on the peninsula, while younger Koreans were demonstrating in the streets against their government and for democracy. Many of these Koreans wanted America to leave, so why not? Many Americans were also weary of backing authoritarian re regimes around the world that seemed to fail to contain communism, countries like Vietnam, and supported instead a stronger position on human rights and democracy as a new emphasis of U.S. foreign policy. Jimmy Carter campaigned on withdrawing all U.S. combat troops from Korea. And then when in office in 1977, President Carter started the process to gradually withdraw all U.S. combat troops within five years. But fortunately, he was persuaded to suspend the truth, troop withdrawal in 1979. In addition, for many years, there was an annual vote in Congress to threaten to withdraw U.S. troops from a particular country or region unless the host governments paid most, if not all, of the burden-sharing costs. So the last vote in my memory affecting Korea took place in 1993, and it received support from nearly half of the U.S. House of Representatives. But the next year, a similar amendment exempted Korea because congressmen were crudely reminded of the threat posed by North Korea when it announced its withdrawal from the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Now, almost no U.S. political leader in either party calls for troop withdrawal from Korea. In fact, a 2013 summit meeting between U.S. President Obama and Korean President Park was widely hailed as the most successful meeting between the leaders of the two countries in recent decades. Many members of Congress from both sides of the aisle are strongly in support of the U.S.-Korea alliance. One, of the, one major reason for the strong bond between the U.S. and Korea is the presence of 1.7 million Americans of Korean descent living in the United States who are now becoming more and more politically active. Even though the first Korean immigrant arrived on U.S. shores just over 100 years ago, most of the immigrants from Korea arrived within the past 40 or 50 years. Over 1,000 South Korean children were also adopted by U.S. parents since the end of the Korean War. In addition, nearly 1.4 million South Koreans visited America in 2013 an increase of 79% since 2006, and they, South Koreans now represent the ninth largest source of foreign visitors to the United States. And approximately 71,000 South Korean students came to the United States for college in the last uh, school year. They represent the third largest contingent of foreign students in America. And when you consider that the first is China and the second is India, with populations in the billions, and Korea is about 50 million. That's still a pretty sizable contingent. Uh, economic ties have also greatly increased over the years, promoting more interactions between Korean and, and American business leaders. Years ago, Korea was a U.S. foreign aid recipient. Now Korea is America's sixth largest trading partner, ahead of Great Britain, France, and India. <laughs> Korea is also one of America's few free trade partners. Korea has opened up more and more of its market to American-made goods and services. So all these factors provide a natural constituency for those interested in fostering deeper ties between Korea and America. So the Korean Economic Institute assists in promoting dialogue and exchange of views between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea. KEI was started in 1982 to promote better understanding of economic relations between the two nations, particularly as Korea became one of the Asian tigers and the rising trade deficit became a source of contention. So KEI is part of Korea's overall effort to promote public diplomacy, primarily working as a think tank to bring notable Koreans and Americans together to discuss issues. Other organizations have similar roles, such as the Korea Society, but their mission is primarily to promote Korean culture. 
KEI's mission is to reach out not only to Washington, D.C., but also to cities and towns across America. So we have several programs that accomplishes this goal. Uh, we have one program that brings together an official from the Korean Embassy and the State Department to visit various cities around the United States to talk to groups of Americans who are interested in foreign policy, uh, to talk about the latest in U.S.-Korea issues. We have a program that goes to universities across America <laughs> where um, students get to play, act, uh, negotiators in the six-party talks. So the, uh, the student that picks the short stick uh, gets to play uh, the North Korean negotiator. <laughs> we have an ambassador's dialogue, which we've been doing since 1992, and we take the two ambassadors, our U.S. ambassador to Korea and the Korean ambassador to the United States, to various cities around America, to talk to uh, civic groups, uh, business leaders, students about U.S. Uh, Korea relationship. We also have um, a Korean American Day where we honor uh, prominent Korean Americans to celebrate their contribution to uh, American society. So we also host some uh, off the record events to promote a frank exchange of views between uh, Korean and American participants. For example, we bring in uh, legislators from the National Assembly to dialogue with senior U.S. officials, including their counterparts in the U.S. Congress. Uh, we also host an opinion leader seminar where, again, uh, senior officials uh, from Korea get to interact with senior officials uh, from America. And this forum actually started in 2001 when many individuals felt that the U.S.-Korea relationship was starting to deteriorate, so they wanted a mechanism to promote uh, more understanding between the two countries. So few nations have their own think tank to promote the relationship with the United States. Even the United States doesn't have its own think tank in other countries. Um, so I think it's uh, the founders of uh, KEI had great insight into seeing the uh, potential of an organization like this to promote uh, uh, understanding between uh, two countries. So I think it's, I'm very fortunate to be working there right now because I feel I'm resting on the shoulders of many who've labored uh, very hard over the years to promote uh, good relations between the U.S. and Korea. And uh, Korea is a country on the move. Um, but Obviously, the hard work of millions of Koreans in creating the miracle on the Han River has done more to promote Korea, not only here in the United States, but around the world, more than what any of us could do here in America. So they sacrificed so that their children and grandchildren could have a better life. So it sounds to me like it's the American dream. So again, thanks for inviting me and, um, and listening to me. Thanks.